Hello, I'm Father Columbus Stewart, Executive Director of the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library, or as we call it, HIMMEL. HIMMEL is an international organization based out of Minnesota in the United States. Our work is solely funded by donations and grants. Our purpose is to preserve and share the world's handwritten past to inspire a deeper understanding of our present and future. Handwritten books, manuscripts, are clues documenting what humans over thousands of years thought important enough to share. It is incredible what these voices from the past have to tell and teach us. Therefore, we photograph manuscripts around the world so their contents can be available for centuries to come. We place a special priority on manuscripts located in regions endangered by war, political instability, or other threats. Preservation begins through partnerships with local libraries, agreements that allow Himmel to make digital images of the manuscripts in their collections. Digitization is done entirely through local teams to whom we provide equipment, training, technical support, and payment for their work. We photograph everything in a collection because we don't know what might be significant in the future. Copies of the digital images are given to the repository that holds the manuscripts. Another copy comes to Himmel in Minnesota. Himmel employs catalogers and other staff to ensure that the digital images of these manuscripts are identified, supported for long-term access, and are made freely available to the public via our website. One of the many advantages that comes with doing the work that we do is that my team and I meet with extraordinary people from every corner of the world. We learn about their culture, their present experiences, and how they see the future. This series gives me the opportunity to introduce these extraordinary people and their stories to all of you, as well as to ask them questions I never had the chance to ask before. It is my belief, and it has been proven again and again throughout history, that when we truly listen to what others have to tell us, we build an understanding, and that is always a good foundation for collaboration. And of course, manuscripts and our written human knowledge are always at the heart of these encounters. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on this journey to listen. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Welcome to this third season of To Listen, a global journey through manuscripts. Those of you who've been with us for the first two seasons know that we've kept the entire title we used for the first two to listen to Global Journey, but this year we've added through manuscripts because we've decided to bring our conversation home to the work that Himmel does preserving the handwritten heritage of communities around the world. We're gonna be working with two communities in this season, beginning with our work in Mali, and then the next one will focus on our work with materials related to the island of Malta and the order of Malta. We chose to focus on Mali for this first episode because it's actually been the place where we've been most active over almost a decade now. It's the largest single project we've ever undertaken in terms of the number of cameras and people working on the project. And it's also one of the most urgent ones given the political and a military situation in that region, again, for over a decade. I'm gonna begin by offering a little bit of background to our work in Mali before I introduce our guests and we get to the fun stuff, which is talking about what's actually found in the manuscripts that Himmel's partners have digitized. The West African country of Mali is a classic example of a colonial creation, borders drawn for reasons which may have little actually to do with the peoples who live there traditionally. It's a country that achieved independence in the 1960s as so many colonies did. And then a country that in recent years has seen a good deal of instability for a variety of reasons, uh, some internal political, some external ethnic, 
And then, of course, the rise of Islamist forces in northern Africa as a whole, which has affected Mali itself. We became immediately interested in Mali when we learned, as the world did, that the famous desert city of Timbuktu had been occupied by a, a kind of complicated coalition of people who were there for both ethnic and religious reasons and occupied that uh, famous city from April 2012 to January 2013. Those of you who follow the manuscript world know that there were initially stories that the famous libraries of Timbuktu, belonging to families and mosques, had been destroyed by the invaders who were seeking to suppress elements of Islamic intellectual culture that they felt were not traditional in their understanding of what tradition meant. The world soon found out that, in fact, a large part of the manuscripts had been removed from Timbuktu before that invasion and occupation. And this was the work of our partner, Abdul Qadir Haidara, who founded the organization Savama DCI in Bamako, which is where the manuscripts remain to this day. I made my first visit to Mali in August of 2013 to meet Abdel Qadr and to understand better the situation with the manuscripts. Returned in December of 2013 to sign an agreement to begin the digitization of what has proven to be hundreds of thousands of documents. And then in January of 2014, the work actually began. Some years after that, we actually went to Timbuktu ourselves in 2017 to work with manuscript collections which had remained with the principal mosques of the city and had simply been hidden rather than evacuated. And then after that, going to the city of Jene with its famous mud mosque to work with collections there as a kind of tag on to a project begun by the British Library some years before with local partners in Jene. Just to give you some idea of the magnitude of this in numbers before we turn it over to our guests. As of sometime in August this year, when I reported on our work at a press conference in Bamako, we had digitized, or I should say, our Malian partners had digitized with our support, more than 310,000 objects. So that means 310,000 distinct manuscript objects. Some of them books, some of them uh, briefer documents, some of them just a page or two. But it's well over four and a half million images. And we even trusted the task of cataloging all of this to the two individuals that you'll meet today, who have created a unique partnership in cataloging, which is raising global awareness of the significance of these manuscripts and of the cultures they represent. I'll begin with our lead cataloger of West African manuscripts, Ali Diakite who is a native of Burkina Faso, although from a part of Burkina Faso, which is culturally very closely associated with Mali. And in fact, as he told me, his passport is actually Malian. So this is again, a reminder that the borders are artificial and that we have to work within present political realities, even if culture itself does not map along those borders. His early education was in Islamic science, he then pursued a PhD in France at the Ecole Normale, Ecole Normale Supérieure de Lyon, and this has launched him into the academic community. Our other guest today is Paul Naylor. Paul is a native of the UK. His PhD is from the University of Birmingham, and before coming to Hemel, he was involved in cataloging the manuscripts of the British Library's Gen A project. So he comes to us with experience from there. I could say more about each of them, but I think it's more interesting to hear them say more about themselves and how they came to this work. So with that, I think I'm going to begin with Ali, because Ali, you have the more natural connection with these materials, given your background. Could you say something about the first time perhaps you encountered a manuscript? And as we're saying for this episode, actually listened to a manuscript. How old were you? I start uh, to show the manuscript when I was uh, 15 years old uh, with my dad. Uh, and after that, it's because my dad was very uh, 
uh, interest into the local history, especially the region we are from in the center of the Mali today, the Mopti region from this area. And my dad <clears throat> immigrated from Mali to Burkina Faso when he was young and he's never back home. And mm. uh, he's uh, always explained us uh, his, uh, his home country, his uh, back home, how he was there. He's not speak or stop or explain me every day, all the time about uh, the uh, Hamdallahi or uh, Caliphate in Seku Amadou, all this ruler in 19th century. He's, uh, and this is how I start to be interesting uh, slowly in the history and in the manuscript. But all what my dad telling me is was uh, orality. And in home, I, he has two or three texts he showed me, he's written by hand. This is the first time I, I see the manuscript. Okay, so you, you learned a lot of oral history from him, but then he also had some manuscripts which showed you how some of this was passed down. Yes. That's amazing. Uh, very few people grow up with manuscripts. So uh, Yes. And, and, and after that, when I finished my high school diploma in Burkina Faso, I <clears throat> decided to to return to Mali. I never been to Mali before that. Yeah. I decided to return to Mali and uh, start my university in Bamako. And uh, my dad was very happy and for that. Uh, I went to Bamako and they asked me, oh, to, to come with my citizenship. And when I give them my um, my big certificate, they say, oh, you have to, to find your Malian document because you don't have, a, you cannot go to university. And I tried to do all these kind of things. It was very quick. Uh, and I start University of the Bamako in Arabic section, and which we call it Arabic and civilization. And after this period, when I finished my MA uh, degree, I, um, I was working on Hamdallah because I have this influence from my, my dad. And I say, okay, I will write an organization Politic de la Lampur Masina de Hamdallah. And I write my, my uh, MA on that. And I need some manuscript this time. And I, I try to, to contact some people in Bamako, but I never got anyone have a direct connection with manuscript until I got Muhammad Zagayete contact. Mm -hmm. um, that was 2008. I called him. He was in uh, Cape Town this time. And he came to Bamako. He called me and I met him. Uh, he asked me, oh, give me your email. When I give him my email, he sent me very nice manuscript from the sermon of Ahmad Lobo in Hamdallah. This was the really, really time I started to be interested in this manuscript. Could you say just a bit for our audience about Hamdallah and why, sort of what this represents and why you were interested in the topic? Yeah, Hamdallah is a uh, it's very interesting place and it's very... Uh, popular in uh, Mali today, uh, especially in the center of the Mali. It's the city capital of the Caliphate of Hamdullah, that's the name. This was a city uh, they tried to build in the uh, beginning of 19th century to play the political role. The same period we have exactly the same uh, Islamic state start in uh, Sokoto and before that in uh, Futa in Senegal today. It's an um, important place because uh, in the 19th century, people traveling from uh, Senegal, from Mauritania, even from Timbuktu to come into Hamdallah to got job to teaching. Um, yeah, it was a very important place in the 19th century. Okay. So you were interested in social and intellectual history there. Exactly. Okay, Paul, so we're going to turn over to you. So how does a, how does a nice lad from a certain northern part of, <laughs> of England uh, get interested in West African Islamic manuscripts. Say, say just a, a, a word about the journey. Yeah, I, I um, had a kind of strange route to, to a PhD, which is where my interest in West African manuscripts started. It was um, it was a bit like a PhD in the sciences. It was a pre-prepared research project that they just wanted somebody to to do, and it was called Arabic Sources for African History, uh, which was you know which is pretty broad. Um, but it also suggested that manuscripts were just this uh, thing, this kind of repository of information that you could draw things from to write your history. Whereas uh, as soon as I started the project, I kind of realized that um, 
you know, these manuscripts were clearly something more than just uh, just raw facts that I, I got very interested in reading them, uh, especially at the British Library, because this PhD studentship was also accompanied with a, a kind of, uh, uh, well, a job, essentially, at the British Library to catalogue their collection of West African manuscripts, which they had acquired uh, through various means in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And these were documents that had clearly not been listened to. They had been bound in very nice uh, matching uh, red uh, leather volumes, but they had basically not been touched since the time that they were acquired. And so, you know, going through these documents, I kind of felt really obliged to, to, to try to tell their story as much as possible. And I got a lot of help um, from uh, colleagues at the British Library in codicology and, and, and other things that would help me to read these documents. And so, I, I yes, I, I suppose it was through, um, through that experience that I really wanted to focus on the on the manuscripts themselves. That's terrific. So your first experience was the typical Western experience of encountering a manuscript which has been removed from where it came from and, yes. and kept in a repository like a library or museum. And I know exactly what you mean about those rebound manuscripts. The Syriac ones are all in those same nice red leather bindings, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> which looks very good. But of course, it's remove some of the material important for the study of the manuscript itself. Um, and then eventually we got you more connected with things actually coming out of Mali more directly, not actual manuscripts, but the images. Um, so I hope that's been a richer experience. No, it, it is. And I think it, it, the digital format in a way captures more uh, accurately the the way that that manuscript might look in situ, because it's not really bound. You can go freely, freely through the pages as you could on site. And also it, it's it's connected. It is part of an archive that was stable through time and often had uh, belonged to the same uh, family for many generations. We can tell that through the copyist note. So it's, yes, it's not been extracted. It is very much uh, mm -hmm. part of the, the local landscape, sure. Let's turn now to how you actually listen to manuscripts. And, and perhaps this is a chance to talk about the way that the two of you work together. Um, so Ali came first to Himmel, if I remember correctly. And Paul, I think you joined us a few months later. Is that mm -hmm. is that right? Yes. But, but it seems like pretty quickly you developed this method of approach. So I wonder, I wonder Ali, if you could talk about once Paul came on board, how the two of you decided to work together? I think uh, it's something uh, it's come uh, naturally. We didn't uh, think about uh, how we we have to <clears throat> to work on. I think when Paul came here exactly two months after I started working in Himo, I was isolated on my uh, my, my office, <laughs> and uh, we. We work together like two or three days in the same office. And after that, we have a big file. We want to clean up the file before we start uh, working on cataloging the manuscript. And um, when Paul finishes our training here, two weeks, he returned back to Chicago. And uh, we try to say, uh, OK, let's try to see if we can share uh, <clears throat> the file and we can work the same file. This is how the idea is stuff. We, we share the file. I can use the file. Paul can use the file. And uh, we mm -hmm. it's because of the, the, maybe two, three months, we are ad, in advance to mm -hmm. many people on the Zoom. We start uh, Zooming. <laughs> 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 it's uh, exactly the end of the January. We almost, we, in 2020, Paul and me, we start uh, doing Zoom. And it's work very well, even, mm -hmm. It's hard for us now to work together in the same place. We cannot. We have to to go. Yeah, that actually. was that was funny. When I when I visited, I usually try to visit uh, the Hill Museum uh, in person at least once a year, and it didn't. It actually doesn't work very well to be in the <laughs> same room together. It's much better to be uh, to be on separate uh, screens, both contributing to the same document. Mm -hmm. We work together, and we 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 really uh, we talk and. Um, we we learn to know each other and yeah it's uh, it's it's very uh, exciting at the same time we we if like uh, if i'm not here if police took his uh, vacation it's not uh, easy for me to work alone i'm saying the same for paul too <laughs> yeah it, yes <laughs> definitely what, what intrigues me about this is that 
it really goes against the traditional Western approach to scholarship, which is solitary and even competitive, that in other contexts, two catalogers might have decided, okay, I'll take number one to 150,000, and you take number, you know, 150,001 or whatever, and you do the rest of it. And it's it's like my material. And then I'm going to publish what I catalog. And you're you're really turning that over and bringing to bear on each manuscript the particular skill and expertise that, that you have to offer, which I think is really terrific. When you work together, we try to do something. Uh, Sometimes I, I know I have more knowledge that, or more experience than Paul, or sometimes Paul have something more than me. And we try to complete what we have together and to give, to share this with the world. That's the, 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 the you most- Usually you have more experience than me, Ali. Oh, yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> sometimes so, the manuscript is on a full, full day. It's the, the, the language or it's the Bambara sometimes. That's something I uh, I know. And yeah, it's 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 really uh, we are completing each other. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's good. Yeah. I, I think that that fusion of the kind of traditional knowledge that you have, Ali, and then the local languages is crucial because there are occasionally texts or words written in the local languages, what what is typically called Ajami, so Arabic script, but local languages. And and Paul, you bring a kind of you know, Western background of study of history and languages and cultures and so on. Yes. And we are, for better or for worse, an institution located in North America. And so, you know, bringing those two perspectives together, I think, is tremendously enriching to mm -hmm. um, the work that, that you do and then what we're able to offer the world. What has been the most intriguing or surprising manuscript discovery that you've made, I suppose I should say that you've made together, because it seems like you you find most of these things together. But yes, we do. If you could just pull out for our listeners one or two examples of things that um you know frankly astonished you when you came across them. The first one is the manuscript uh, we found uh, uh is uh, this they have a uh, it's it's an imperfect manuscript. It's no, and not end, and but the we have a small knot, like a two or not on this manuscript. They try to say, "Hada min al kutub alati wudi dat fi hamdallah fi na khuruj ahlu futa minha wa hi li Sheikh Ahmad Sheikh Ahmad." Paul can uh, translate this word. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, right. Well, essentially, it's the. Uh one of the texts that uh, was found um, from the books of Sheikh Ahmad. And so Sheikh Ahmad is Ahmad Lobo, who is the founder of the Caliphate of Abdullahi that, that, that Ali mentioned. Caliphate of Hamdullahi. Yeah, and so it's, it's very, this text is, is very clearly a, a survivor, you know, because, so Hamdullahi came to an end when, the, when it was uh, sacked by the armies of Omar Tal, who was another, um, kind of Muslim uh, scholar leader who, who took took over that region. And so he, uh, a lot of the books were destroyed. Some of them were taken by um, by Sheikh Omar for his library. And then when the French uh, invaded that territory, they took Sheikh Omar's books, uh, all of them to Paris, where they're in the Bibliothèque Nationale de Paris, to Paris now. This text is obviously a survivor. It's been through several, um, so, you know, it's escaped several, uh, destruction or relocation uh, and somehow it has remained uh, in um, the Timbuktu region and we, we're still not really sure how uh, how that happened um, but it's clearly yeah. um, from Ahmed Lobo him, himself. Yeah the important thing here is uh, sometimes it's not like the the quantity of the text but the quality this is only two or three lines very short line but it's telling us it's good this copies right the knot is on the end he say in the end the knot they have the knot at the end of the manuscript to say this text is from Ahmad Lobo but today we don't have this end mm -hmm. and he, he exactly he tried to reproduce the same thing at the beginning of the text in the knot very short knot it's very interesting for us uh, as a historian. 
how we can find our interesting thing in two or three lines. So which collection is it from? It's from uh, BMH. Uh, BMH, yeah, it's Bibliotek uh, Mama Hydra. So it's one, that's one of the largest uh, libraries from um, Timbuktu, over 40,000 manuscripts. And of course, that's the family library of our partner, Abdel Qadr Hydra. It's a reminder to us that manuscripts are important for carrying text, but they're also important for carrying other information. So the scribal note, the colophon, even binding materials in certain locations are very revealing about the social context of the manuscript itself. And so the manuscript bears so much information apart from the actual words of the main text it conveys. Give us another example of something that was particularly exciting. The one I would share is this uh, really interesting uh, guide to transcribing the Fufulde language in Arabic. So this is a really specific <laughs> readership. You know, you have to already speak Arabic. Uh, you have to uh, speak Fufulde and you have to uh, be able to, to read and write uh, both languages. So this is, is essentially explaining you how to write your own language in, in Arabic script. So very specific audience um, and, and a really detailed, uh, it's a very long text actually. Yeah, and it's uh, abridgment of another you know, text. And you see the text is for the beginner. That means here, and even we have the name of the, the advanced uh, or uh, text too, he he already the author already write, and he give a, a specific uh, example. He say, oh, like uh, this word in Arabic. Like I think I remember he he mentioned Zubab, Zubab, the insect, yeah, the flies, flies. He mm -hmm. say how you pronounce this uh, in uh, full full the boo 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 is the is the one or uh, plural and singular and. He tried to explain very well, and it's a really, really interesting text. It gives us so many information on how uh, they start uh, to developing their own uh, education system and uh, adapting with their culture. The reason this is so interesting is that you have these African languages with rich oral literature, oral histories, this kind of thing, but they were not written languages until Islam brought um, the written language of the Quran and other texts and the Arabic script was available. So the use of these scripts to write down languages which were previously oral tradition is a it's pretty common feature in a lot of places that we've worked and a very important one because it enables then uh, the preservation of some of these traditional accounts and stories and legends and so on, which in the global era can easily get lost as those chains of oral transmission weaken and sometimes even are broken. That's pretty exciting for you, Ali, when you come across these these things yeah. that fulfill the and so on. Yeah, it's exciting for me for uh, many reasons. Uh, the first one, because uh, I'm a fulfilled and as this uh, speaker, I'm not specialized on the, this kind of subject, genre of the text, but I can try to understand it. Uh, and yeah, it's exciting uh, to, to learn in my, uh, my mom tongue language. It's very exciting. Nobody who's listening to this broadcast, with perhaps the exception of two or three people who may watch it, uh, will ever have heard Fulfolding. Could you say something or chant a little something in Fulfolding just so that people get a feel for the language? Sure, we can say easily in Fulfolding, welcome or hi, it's a Fufu, Fufu, F O F O. Just mean uh, welcome, or it's mean at the same time, or uh, hi in full full day, or okay. jam wali. That's mean good morning. Yeah. So give us give us a sentence or two, maybe some poetic phrase or something. Miyeti ma alla anjulu do ummi do ah ah. I'm thanks to God. You uh, we have to thanks all the times. So Paul, you have another one. The thing that truly surprised me was, um, so just to give some context, a lot of the uh, manuscripts from Timbuktu is what we might call uh, esoteric or magical texts in the sense that, um, you know, you have to uh, do something. Usually this involves uh, 
using verses from the Quran, which were thought to be not only spiritually helpful, but also helpful for a range of medical, psychological conditions, but in chorus with local trees and plants. So a typical example would be, you know, you take these two verses from the Quran, uh, you write them on this writing board, you wash off the water, and then you mix in these kind of leaves or tree bark or, or natural substances. And so this in itself is, is very interesting. It's kind of this fusion between local pharmacology pharmacological traditions and uh, chronic medicine, which is practiced uh, all over the Muslim world. But the really interesting thing about this example was that this is a fa'idah to avoid capture by an nasara which usually in, in Arabic, classical Arabic, means Christians, but in this context almost certainly means uh, Europeans. And so we don't know whether this is to do with the transatlantic slave trade or whether this is to do with the travaux forcés or the forced labor of the, the French colonial period or even forced conscription in, in one of the two world wars. But it's just a really shocking example of how these documents that would otherwise be dismissed as, you know, sort of uh, esoteric and not, not very, uh, very uh, kind of sociologically interesting really do show uh, the preoccupations of this society, which un unfortunately one of those preoccupations was the threat of uh, this, this uh, European incursion. It's a reminder of the way that some of these highly traditional cultures um, touch our own, or, or perhaps I should say we touch theirs. And, you know, some of these uh, foreign adventures that were so much a part of the 19th and 20th centuries, and of course, sadly, are not over yet. Um, and and this, this actually, this, uh, we published a little bit about this, um, this document, and it had a huge amount of attention in Brazil, for example where, of course, many captives from West Africa ended up there. And so just to kind of demonstrate that this material has a global interest uh, now, and it was it got a lot of, lot of attention when we published that. What particular challenges do you face when you work with manuscripts from Mali? I think uh, the big challenge we have is the number of the manuscripts. We have uh, a very large number of the manuscripts and this itself is challenging us so <laughs> and it's keep growing the the number of the manuscript we have and this manuscript the we have uh, many many of them it's not complete this is another challenging we have and how we can we can manage to didn't miss any important manuscript your important text i would say it's so it's a big challenge for us. How to make sure that people find this material? How to make sure that people find what they what they want to find? And you know, if you have uh, five hundred or six hundred poems in praise of the Prophet, how do you differentiate them and make each one uh, unique so that you know people who are interested in the in the topic can differentiate between this this huge amount of of material? When you work with <laughs> material, you don't have the same kind of existing reference works that you might have, for example, with Latin manuscripts or even classical Arabic manuscripts from the Middle Eastern tradition, that you're kind of, you're not quite pioneers because people like Charles Stewart and others have done a lot of work on West African manuscripts, but you're coming across a lot of names of people and places and so on that you just can't easily look up in a book somewhere. No, I think we would probably become the reference in the future, just because, yeah, as you said, a lot of these names are, are lamentably you know, absent from international databases such as Library of Congress, uh, the Virtual International Authority file. But we are actually, you know, with our work at Himmel, we're adding all of those names onto those databases so that West Africa is, is better represented. But then also, you know, other people who come across these names in their collections will be able to, to link them with ours and just build a greater understanding of this knowledge tradition. Yes, and that's what you mentioned now about the local name. This is a big challenge to to make them, to make them, because of sometimes we have to take a very hard decision how we we because we need to to choose one or only two options of the name will be official, and we don't know in Arabic. You know, me it can be ma or me. You, you don't know which how you do. We it's very challenging or sometimes. I remember if we across some full full the name for Fulani name, or Paul asked me, or Ali, <laughs> what you decide? And I said, I don't know. 
this took us some time. Uh, if I said, Paul, oh, let's wait uh, next week, I will think about, you know, yeah. at, uh, at the end, we have to decide to, to make the name for uh, this person, even we, mm -hmm. we don't know if it's, it's the right pronunciation we use or no, but yes, it's a big challenge for us. But, but the good thing about digital collections, you can always change them. It's not like a print exactly. catalog. That's right. That's right. But sadly, you, you can't ask the person how they prefer to be called. Um, so there, there, there is a little bit of, uh, you know, retrospective imagination involved in that. Uh, I want to ask you what you may have learned about yourself or your own passions or interests as you work on this. Have, have you found yourself changed in some unexpected way or following a particular scholarly avenue that you hadn't anticipated that's been really exciting? For me, I've learned uh, patience. <laughs> um, I mean, to study any language uh, in detail, you have to be patient. But um, with this sort of work, you, you really have to be <laughs> very patient. And to, that kind of allows you, in fact, to have a respect for all of the, you know, the people that wrote these manuscripts who have, were also incredibly patient in this is kind of very labor intensive work and just the uh, the quantity. Uh, yes, you could be frustrated by it, but I'm more kind of humbled by the extent to the, of this material and and uh, trying to to see my role as, as, as getting this material out there has been very motivating for, for me personally. I think uh, it's a great question. It's a uh... What I learned uh, working on this manuscript is uh, humility. Humility. Because this manuscript, when we read them, usually at the end of the text, the author or the copyist, he says, this is a routine, writing by uh, a student or the disciple. I don't know anything. I don't do this. I don't. They are really, really uh, try to, to be humble, like Paul mentioned now. That's uh, is something. I learned, and they say that we don't know anything. If you see any mistake sometime, please correct it because <laughs> you are not in this life anymore. This kind of thing is uh, is talking to me directly, to be honest. Yeah. It's, and it's so different to the Western tradition. And then you copied this 50, 60 page manuscript, which must have been a huge endeavor. And you actually don't want to be known for it. You just say, uh, this was written by uh, nobody, it doesn't matter who I am. Uh, I'm full of my, you know, what, what do they keep saying? Um, uh, al yeah, yeah, so it's uh, um, how we say, um, lacking in knowledge and lacking in, in, uh, in um, patience, but uh, uh, abundant in sleep and uh, laziness and all of these uh, terrible things <laughs> yeah. they say about themselves <laughs> at, at the end of the manuscript just because they they don't want to be known for their work they want to be they want to recognize that this is a between them and and god or between them and their vocation they, they don't care about putting their name on so it, it's it's very yeah that's been very interesting yeah. to see this repeated hundreds and hundreds of times as we catalog these manuscripts that's certainly the opposite of a, a sort of a modern Western approach where it's all about copyright and author's <laughs> right, this kind of thing. Um, yeah, and, and one of the par particularity things now, Paul and maybe have evidence on this culture. Now, we, we really are confident what we're saying. They, they don't, doesn't want to, to, to give their name, the author of the text usually. He never, you will see the complete text, but we don't know the author. Mm. Because they don't want them to be known. This is something uh, we have evidence now. They do it uh, intentionally. It's not like something mm -hmm. they forgot or they, they, they no, they don't want to, to, to know. We were speaking earlier about the fact that if you go to a Western library, which happens to have manuscripts from this culture or that place, they have a few that were cherry picked or maybe a small collection that they acquired <laughs> in the colonial era. But you're actually working with, um, in a way, living collections. So collections which were in C2, in Timbuktu until recently, or in the case of the, the collections from the mosques in Timbuktu are still there. And we've been able to digitize the whole collection and present it as a collection. But what do you find when you regard these manuscripts in that sort of collective form? Yeah, it's, it's it's important to know that it, it is really the first time that anybody's been 
doing this, you know, because these collections are in in Globo, just everything that was there was digitized by the, uh, you know, Malian partners in, um, in Bamako. Some things that is surprising is that a lot of this material is, is much more uh, recent, more modern than presupposed, you know, because we've always focused on the the medieval history of, of Timbuktu, we miss all of these uh, developments in the 18th and 19th century and even 20th century during the colonial period. And so it's still history, it's still culture, it's still knowledge. And I think as time goes forward, our work will hopefully be, you know, more and more valuable as, as time goes on. Yeah, this uh, manuscript, some of them are constant. It's uh, from gener- generation to generation, like uh, we generate our mosque uh, uh, library, the Asuit library. We know this by uh, copy not and other not we have. We know this manuscript uh, is really, uh, it's not like uh, the kind of a new library. Like um, I don't want to 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 talk any n- names, but it's uh, we can see it's original manuscript, and it's not like uh, five thousand or ten thousand. It's two thousand manuscripts, but they are all uh, um, pretty uh, interesting texts. And they stayed within the same family. So some collections have clearly stayed within the same family for a long time. You can tell by the copies note. Other collections are perhaps amalgamations of smaller libraries or maybe the result of more modern collection practices. And so when you you can really start to define collections once you, I mean, and just full disclosure, we've only, we've catalogued two collections fully out of 36 libraries and we're working on another two more now. So we can't say anything definitive, but it's interesting that we can make these observations, kind of collection level observations once we've, once we've finished. I think eventually looking at all of them and being able to say there's a distinctive profile to this particular one or mm-hmm. the collections that are associated with mosques look like this and the ones which are simply family collections which may reflect the interest of one of the other ancestors who was a scholar or collector I think that'll be really fascinating yeah. um, how are collections actually used so how are they formed how are they used and so on mm-hmm. So we, we we know when we talk about manuscripts that they tell us about the past. I mean, that's obvious. They were written in the past. They were the voices of, of our forebears. Do you find that these manuscripts have something to teach us about life today or about the future? In other words, is their message, does it continue to be relevant in some way and therefore important for us to listen to? Today, uh, we think uh, we are uh, the world is so uh, much industrialized and we have a digitalization technology. But if we try to to look uh, closely, I think uh, it's the same curiosity, but different way to explore this curiosity. I think, and it's no much changing. I think we still are uh, learning many many things about uh, this manuscript. People often look kind of outside for change and for for inspiration, but I just hope that, uh, and as a result, you know, local traditions can can die out because people just presume that it's uh, better elsewhere. But I, I hope that um, with these manuscripts going forward, you know, if 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 people learn more about their their history and the intellectual traditions from their their own places, I, I hope that the future they can build will be more perhaps perhaps more relevant and with their own uh, with their own history it, it will be a, it'll be a stronger tree or plant if it grows on its own roots yeah exactly and somebody it, else's yeah and because of you know many of these libraries you know they are in 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 mali they are private libraries and there are several gatekeepers uh, you know so that uh, you know malians may not uh, find it easy to access these collections uh, in their own country but hopefully now that they're uh, online it will be easier to access and to, to take your own lessons from uh, from the material. This is an important point, I think, for our, our viewers to understand that very often manuscripts held in private collections in the regions where we work are not really accessible to scholars uh, directly because they aren't held in research libraries where you just sort of show up and you show ID and they give you permission to come in and look at the manuscript. They're, they are very closely held. And we found in a number of locations that the digital images that we have are providing local people 
who may be physically very close to the manuscripts, access to them that they would not otherwise have. So, so that's a real service to the communities of origin, not simply a service to, to scholars who may be in Europe or North America. So I don't know what typical image people likely to watch this program have of Mali, but if if you can sort of think of a misconception or a misunderstanding that people might have um, that you think needs to be challenged by your experience of reading these manuscripts and understanding the culture more deeply, what would that misconception be? We have many examples, but I will try to, to, to be brief, give one example, like an education system. I think people presume that education system is modern development in West Africa. But system use it to be one on one, individualized now overflow with school. Before the system we have in the West Africa is like one by one. You come to the teacher, you see, he gives your 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 own class or your lesson and you go to, to, to learn. This is exactly what we, we even in the modern um, in a developed country today, they start to back this uh, kind of uh, to be very close uh, to the to your teacher. This exists in the region before, but with the after a colonial period, we try to another you know, system is didn't work. And I think it's good to to see in our own tradition what we have and try to do uh, a good uh, good thing there. Yeah. So I think that's important. This this lifting up of traditional educational models and the fact that education happened. Exactly. It happened and it was incredibly standardized. You don't have to have a written syllabus for something to be standardized. And if you reframe it as a private tutor, that sounds very advanced and appealing, but it's 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 just the all of these the distinctions get um, get lost, I suppose, with the power dynamics of the of, of the time. And the program and the system was very stable. You cannot uh, skip or uh, like the, it's it's the book. You have to read this book finished before you start the other other book. And each uh, book have uh, their own uh, specialty. You have to go to learn the book. Sometimes you have to travel into from uh, town to town just to learn one book and you back. Even sometimes Paul and me see this kind of uh, indication. Some mm -hmm. copies say, "Oh, I travel into this town to learn on this book and." back to my, country, yeah. to my, my and, town. And just like in our system, it also depends where you go to school and who your teacher is, who, who you know, who you studied with. You know, there's really not that much difference um, yes. if we just zoom out a little bit. Yeah, mm -hmm. in after the colonial period in the region, one of the two things uh, we still uh, have a problem in the region, in the West Africa, any country, took, not every, West Africa or the Africa, is the education and healthcare system. I know it's more people now than before. I, I know that, but I think we can learn many, many things about uh, this system we have before. So if listening to the past and if listening to all the voices that you hear in these manuscripts is in fact important for our present and future, um, what gives you hope that we're actually making progress on doing that? That we're actually listening to these? Maybe it's your own work. Maybe it's the work of Himmel. Maybe it's what you see happening in the broader scholarly world. But are we actually making progress on listening to these voices? Yes, definitely. I mean, uh, <laughs> the fact that the fact that even five, ten years ago, our project would not have been possible. You know, digitization project to this scale would would not have been possible. And perhaps you know, me and Ali's collaboration. Uh, may not have been possible. You know, we are located in uh, different cities, but yet remote work has has enabled us to to accomplish what we've accomplished. And these are all new uh, new developments that would not have been possible uh, up until very recently. I remember when even when I start writing my PhD, I have to travel in the, to, to Timbuktu or Jenne to find only one or two manuscripts I need. Mm. But today, maybe uh, it's. Uh, digitalization or this kind of uh, huge material you have in online, even I know the demo is the one champion in the world for this material, but uh, 
it's very easy today to sit in your house and ask a manuscript or just check from your phone. This is give us hope. Yeah, and, and also the fact that, you know, digitizing and cataloging is just the first step, really. I mean, getting the material out there is the first step. I mean, next comes a kind of self-awareness and, and empowerment that can be derived from these materials by both people in the region, you know, reconnecting with their own cultures and from people outside of the region who, who had no idea that any of this uh, existed. So it's the, it's the first step, I think, what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, bit by bit, whether people are sitting in a cafe in Bamako or a, a cafe in Minneapolis or anywhere else with their laptop, they can listen to these manuscripts that you have helped make available by letting people know what they might find in them. As, as people who have given your lives to listening to the past, what personally brings you hope as you look toward the future? You personally. One of the issues that we have today is that the, the, the past that everybody imagines is a past that is really weighted towards uh, certain regions and, and certain cultures. I mean, even, you know, I mean, even in, in this country, the history that is taught in schools is, is reflects very clearly a history post the European uh, presence in the Americas, and even then only on really very specific portions of that history. And part of the reason is because we simply these voices are not being listened to or they are very difficult to find now or difficult difficult to access uh, i mean especially on the west african case you know uh, not compared to before you know arabic is not used uh, as much um, it's more likely to be french now uh, and certainly uh, local languages are written uh, a lot of the time in latin characters rather than arabic characters so sometimes the material exists but it's just not accessible and so i think if the more that we uncover and expose these these voices from the past the more we can build this kind of inclusive present in which everybody uh, is recognized everybody has a voice everybody has a history uh, as well it's not just certain people that have a history um, because of, uh, of of the priorities of the past yeah what you want to say is, uh, is true and what uh, give me a hope for the future? I think the, the mixing of the culture, that is something very important. Like, uh, just I can give the example of the Jesus and the Turkey school. This uh, different culture and language have the same message, but they didn't talk each other before, until now, until uh, before him. This uh, kind of, uh, we, because we have this kind of text in Arabic, we have them in, we have them in Persian, but we, you, now it's very easy to to uh, to across or to see all this uh, cultural uh, coming together. This is something gives me hope, and I think uh, it will be continued for for sure. I, I like that point about this sort of confluence and connection of cultures. Exactly. That we, we think of things as quite distinct and distinct boxes. And one of the things we're finding in our work with both Islamic and Christian manuscripts is the way the texts move from region to language. They even cross religious boundaries. And so showing that um, that sort of vast transmission of ideas, culture and language mm -hmm. from the Middle East to South Asia, from the Middle East to West Africa. Exactly. Um, I, I think that. That's going to be one of the greatest contributions of Himmel's work is being able to support that sort of comparative manuscript study and and create intellectual maps, mm -hmm. which we can do to a certain extent now, but it's going to be so much richer when all these manuscripts are cataloged and available. Yeah. And, and demonstrating that the world was, was globalized before uh, a modern concept of globalization. I mean, Timbuktu was very much connected uh, to many regions of the world, and we can tell that through the, the manuscript record. Yeah. So what, one of my common lines is to say that manuscripts were the original Internet of Things <laughs> uh, yeah. because they were all over, but they were connected. Mm -hmm. exactly. They came from places, they went to places and, and created this vast web of exchange and influence. Yeah. And that is one of the particularity of uh, our institution here, the HEMO, because uh, we have a different, usually you will have a, a website working only in the Christian manuscript or only on the Islamic manuscript, or even not only Islamic manuscript, just on the 
some part of the, um, the region, like uh, Middle East, but uh, even the, or on the one West Africa, like one we have, but here we try to, to do something, uh, uh, I'm not sure if we 20 years old, we can imagine this, uh, what we, we're doing today. The scope of the work from West Africa to uh, Pakistan and India, I mean, that whole arc of the Islamic <laughs> world, and then the Christian world, which is sort of, you know, right alongside it, um, that, that is going to be extraordinary. Why does cultural preservation matter? Yeah, I think uh, it's matter because uh, it's helped us to understand and learn from the past and uh, to preserve uh, what the generation before us did and to learn uh, their mistake so that we can correct ourselves. That is uh, what human society have already done before. So if we begin to understand the past more accurately uh, and uh, the fact that the past contains many different voices, many different cultures, um, we can build this inclusive present in which everybody is recognized and everybody has a voice and more importantly, everybody has a history. So I'd like to thank Ali and Paul for joining us for this conversation. There's so many things I was struck by. One of them, I was struck by the point about traditional education with the sort of one-on-one -on -one learning relationship and the fact that the two of you, in a sense, are doing that in your cataloging work together, except you're teaching each other. So it's not a master disciple. It really is a partnership. Um, breaking down traditional academic and scholarly hierarchies and, and competitive attitudes. I think that models something very important for the future of manuscript studies, where we are going to depend on each other and our various expertises to understand that fuller picture. And, and Paul, your point about inclusivity, that by bringing everybody's voice into the conversation, we begin to have something more like an accurate understanding of what the world was like, um, early modern era, modern era, and so on. I think that's crucial. One of the points I've made before about Hemmel's work is that so much Western scholarship has been based on those manuscript collections in libraries in London and Paris and Berlin and elsewhere, or the Vatican. But it's always a partial view. And by going to the places the manuscripts came from and digitizing the manuscripts that are still there, we may not get a full 360, but we're certainly getting a more accurate depiction of what the intellectual, religious, social, cultural life of these places was compared to that highly partial view of the manuscripts extracted from their context. So I, I thank you for your reminders of that. And I think we've, we've clearly demonstrated today the importance of the work that Hemmel's been doing with its partners, his partners at Savama, DCI, and Bamako, at the Gen A Manuscripts Library in Gen A, with the families in Timbuktu, as in so many other countries and regions, because we are bringing those voices into the conversation. But it begins with listening, listening to the manuscripts, which the two of you do every day. I'm actually a little jealous of you because as executive director, I don't get to spend as much time with manuscripts as I would like, but it inspires me to hear the two of you speak of your work. I'm gonna encourage our audience to share this program um, by sharing the link to the YouTube um, presentation of the video. Those of you who are watching it in the um, premiere broadcast, I encourage you to provide program feedback via the online survey that you'll be receiving soon. And for our next program in this series of season three of To Listen, A Global Journey Through Manuscripts, we'll turn to Malta and our conversation will be with uh, Daniel Gullo, the director of the Malta Study Center at Hemel and his colleague, Liam Gauci at the Malta Maritime Museum. And they'll be reflecting on the significance of that small island for the history of the whole Mediterranean world and relations between Christian Europe and the Ottoman East. So thank you for joining us for this presentation. It's been great, Ali and Paul. A travail et bon courage for your work <laughs> on these manuscripts. Thank you very much. Merci. Bye. 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 Bye.